sowed or fray. We have felt thee here, and lovely pressure can't describe it. It's our among us, and our within us, and our here. And our hearts are overflowing with thanksgiving for what thou hast done for us today, and what thou hast done in us today. Tonight we offer thee ourselves again, just to let thee speak here at my lips. This is my mouth, voice, use it, and mind, heart. We all open our minds now, all of us, to let thee walk in them, plant thoughts there, that it will grow. We all open our hearts now to let thee pour thy wonderful, compassionate love into their, those hearts until we love as thou dost love. We all try to hold our inner ear close to thy lips inside so that thou canst whisper as well as speak aloud tonight. Now speak, we are listening. What did you bring us here to say to us tonight? Amen. I often plead with a congregation to pray for me while I talk, and I would with you, but I don't need to, because you know how to do that, and it's so wonderful. The easiest place I speak in the whole world is before a CFO camp. And I think especially this one, this year, it's amazing to me how far this camp has gone already this Sunday night, the second evening. Uh, as I walked into the your presence this morning, it just seemed to me as though I felt the Holy Spirit moving among you. Have you felt it yet? And you step out of it and step in it, you notice the difference, like getting in and out of water. They say that an institution is a long shadow of a man, and I suspect that many of you have been thinking about Glen Park. This institution has gone on after he has left us, and many of the CFO camps are more wonderful than they ever were before. This is the fourth one that I've been in this year. Perfectly wonderful. Florida, California, Pennsylvania, now this one. But if this continues the way it started, we're going to tremendous heights. It's going to sweep up, not over our souls, but sweep our souls up toward heaven. And tonight I am going to talk to you, I feel led by him to give you the best that I know. It's uh, really plagiarizing. I'm stealing what I tell you out of a book, but it's a book I wrote myself, so I guess it's legitimate. It's uh, Christ Liveth in Me. I generally talk about this, the very last subject in a CFO camp, but you're, it seems to me, ready for the best I've got right now. And I want you to pray that he may have a perfect gangway through me and through you while we talk about what uh, many people think, including myself and I think yourself, is the ultimate truth in all our Christian religions. This is the ultimate. This is the last one. It's the one toward which all the others are gradually going. 
they sing it. I was a little disappointed when you took those children away here. They can understand this at least as well as the older people. What I'm going to talk about tonight is our education very often disqualifies us from understanding the deepest of all Christian truth. We know so much we lose our faith. At Christmas time, we sing, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sins and enter in and be born in us today. Profound truth there. O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there's room in my heart for thee. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Oh, what a salvation this that Christ lives in me. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. This lovely one that Mark just taught us. Now, are these all just figures of speech? As it were, the preachers say. J. B. Phillips, the man who wrote that wonderful translation of the New Testament that many people think is the best yet, even better than the one the British have just put out. J.B. Phillips says that Christ liveth in me is the profoundest experience of the Christian religion. If this is really true, if Christ does come into us really, and if he stays there, that surely is the most marvelous experience in our lives if we know it is true. Nothing in the world is so important as that. I want to try to prove that now. There's an old song. I don't know the tune. It was so old that we don't have it in any hymn book anymore. Probably written about three or four hundred A.D. Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, if he's not born in these, Thy soul is still forlorn. No matter if he was born in Bethlehem unless he was born in you. Now, that's all it's about. Let's try to understand it. Does anybody ever have Christ living in it all the time? And millions of people said they did. Paul was one of them. He said, Christ lives in me. He didn't say it once. Do you know how many times? He said it 66 times. Not twice the same way. He never does say things quite twice the same way. Here's one of them. He said, our bodies are meant for Christ to dwell in. He said, take Christ into your heart. He said, I pray that he may live in your heart. He said, do you not understand that Christ lives in you? And then he makes a statement. I won't quote all the 66. I wouldn't get anything else said tonight. But he makes a statement that's very startling. You can't get to heaven unless Christ is in your heart, in you. Here it is. You preachers will remember where, where that comes from. Christ in you is your hope of glory. And glory means heaven. Now, many people uh, are bothered by all of this. They know that Christ vanished in a cloud, and the Bible says he went up and sits in heaven by the right hand of God. How can he be in your heart and up there both? Those people say he poured the Holy Spirit down, and that's what's in our hearts, not Christ. So I think we'll have to get past that hurdle right away. How can Christ be at God's right hand and still be in your heart? Well, uh, immediately you ask the question, where is that right hand of God? Now I'll tell you where it is from the 139th Psalm. 
If I stand up into heaven, thou art there. But if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning like an airplane and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. It's a pretty big hand out there, here, and everywhere. In fact, the older I grow, the more I'm stunned at the size of God. He must be as big as the universe. Takes a light billions of years. Ten billion years the light keeps traveling before the most distant galaxies reach us. He's out there, but he's also here. He's everywhere. Now, another thought about this, this idea that uh, Christ can go up there some distance and sit up there and send his Holy Spirit down here, that the, the, the Trinity would be separated just isn't true. They never separate. It isn't true that one of them goes in one end and the other goes and takes a charge of another part of the universe and they come together once in a while and have a conference. It just isn't true. Where one is, the other is. They're always together. Now, let me just illustrate this in case you want to follow this through. I'm not going into theology too much tonight, but we just got to get past this hurdle here that Christ isn't here. And some people think because he's somewhere in heaven where that is. In uh, Acts 16, verse 6, it says that Luke is writing, he says that Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak in Asia. And so in the next verse it says, they tempted to go to Bithynia then, but this time the Spirit of Jesus didn't allow it. And so the next verse says, they went on into, uh, they concluded that, they should want to, that, the, that God wanted them to go to Asia. They got the whole Trinity. Now there, certainly one didn't talk to him one time, and then the next verse another talked, and then another. That's nonsense. If the Holy Spirit's in you, the Spirit of Jesus is in you. Now, I'm going to quote two, two verses from Scripture, if this isn't too hard, but I think you've got to get by this, uh, any of you who are wondering about it, because I have uh, some very good friends and, who uh, want to talk about the Holy Spirit in you, but want to leave out the Spirit of Jesus in you. That's just a difference. Here's what it says. In Christ, the whole of God dwells. God's own Spirit is what you receive. God's Spirit makes his home in you. God's Spirit, you have shared the very thoughts of God. The Holy Spirit comes from God and dwells in you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. A little while ago, it was the temple of Christ. He poured his Holy Spirit into your heart. I pray that you may be completely filled with God. And Jesus says, even as our Father art in me, and I in thee, that they may be in us, and that we may be, that the, the love which thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Here we see what Paul calls, and here, this is very profound, although I didn't think his children would have understood it. He, Paul says that this is the secret truth which God has his praises but revealed to us through Jesus Christ. The astounding secret, the astounding secret truth is that the Trinity wants to live inside of us and we inside of the Trinity. Now, uh, I've talked a whole lot about what Paul says. Now I want to talk about what Jesus has to say about this. He has some things that shock you. Oh, I wish now I'd have brought this new English version. I'll quote from it from memory anyhow. Here's what Jesus is saying in the sixth chapter of John about this. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Now then it goes on to say right after that what you'd expect. They were shocked at that. It sounded like cannibalism. The disciples said, 
And this is what the new British, the new British version printed last year says. This is a hard saying. Who can stomach it? So it says. And then it says that a great many went away. Then the disciples came to Jesus and said, What's this all about? And Jesus said, Listen, the words that I spoke to you were about spirit and life. The spirit gives life. The flesh is of no avail. It doesn't matter. He meant spirit. And so when we have the Lord's Supper, we're eating that bread, we're eating, drinking that wine, <coughs> his flesh is emblemized by the bread, but his spirit is what he wants to get inside of us. The central ritual of the Christian church is the Trinity trying to get inside of us and live there. Jesus Christ. It means, of course, many other things. I suppose they're all true. Everything anybody can think of. Oh, by the way, I hope that some of you ministers, especially, but all of you for that matter, as I talk about this profound truth tonight, are going to try to help me. I've got a little book written about this now, but it isn't finished. I hope that in two or three, four years, it'll be twice as big. This other profound aspects of this deep truth will occur to us. If you get one, tell me. I thought of one as I sat there a little while ago. Maybe I'll tell you what it was after a while. Now, I didn't understand how Jesus could offer his flesh and his blood in bread and wine until I worked among the cannibals. I've been out here among the cannibals in New Guinea twice. A year ago, I was there again, the second time. And I was there about 12 years ago. I haven't got time to tell you about them tonight, but if you want that story, I'll tell it some night. But I never knew until I worked among those cannibals why they eat you. They don't eat you because they like you or because they're hungry. In fact, this long pig, as they call human beings, doesn't taste as good as the other pig. But they eat you <coughs> if they admire you. If you're good looking, they eat you because they think they might get that good look. If you're strong, they eat you because they think you might get your strength. <clears throat> if you're smart, they eat you in order to get your brain. And if you're a leader, they eat you to get your leadership. It's a compliment to be eaten by a cannibal. <laughs> now, they didn't see anything in me they wanted. They didn't want this anyhow, and so I'm still here. The only person who ever offered himself, no, no missionary ever did that I've heard of, but one person offered himself to be eaten. His name is Jesus Christ. The only person in history. He loves parables. And this thing is his outstanding chief parable of himself getting shocked people with that illustration. And, uh, he did the best he could with the knowledge they had then. If he had lived today, he'd have given them another parable. Because we know so much now, I dare say that every adult in this room knows what I'm going to tell you. It's about when a male cell, spermatozoa, penetrates the female cell, what happens inside? There are in both of those cells, many tiny little things, infinitesimal, invisible almost, there are in both of them long strings called chromosomes. And those strings are all in pairs, and the pair splits apart in the male cell, it splits apart in the female cell, they come together again, and behold, there's a new creature. This Partaking of the male and partaking of the female. When Christ comes in us, we come in Christ too. We partake of his the divine nature, and behold, there's a new creature. You must be born again. The nearest thing that Jesus could ever come to that in his day, when they didn't know anything about medicine like we do today, was what he told Nicodemus, the, the, probably the most learned man that ever talked to Jesus. 
at least uh, deliberately, came to him at night. And Nicodemus, he told him this profound truth. Unless one is born anew, we can't enter the kingdom of God. Unless he's born of the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. And so when God's Spirit permeates ours, penetrates ours, as the male and the female cell go together, we know there's a new creature. We partake of the nature of God. That new eternal spirit of God joined with your spirit makes you eternal. That's how immortality comes out of mortality. When, when you died in your life, now it is with Christ in God. And when he comes, you will be seen with him in glory. Paul went so far as to say this. He saw what I'm saying clearly. He said, I am suffering a mother's birth pang until Christ is formed in your heart. That's pretty profound in that I believe a child can understand it about as well as a grown-up person. At least some of us. All right, he comes in on what conditions? Because I want him in my heart, in my mind, in me, to inhabit this body. He comes in if. If I ask him, he won't come in unless I do. But there's more to it than that. I learned what I know about this best from a parable of Roland Brown, Marsh's husband. I don't remember any of his other sermons, but I'll never forget this is my dying day. And uh, this is what he said. He said he had a dream one night. Alan Hunter says it was an authentic dream. I, Alan was there and heard this story. It impressed him too. And I wouldn't wonder if he's telling it ever since. Roland said, I dreamed that I saw my own mind. Now, Roland's mind and Marsh's minds are both pretty big minds because they've got the whole world in their minds, in their hearts, too. Some people's minds are so little they don't need a head this big. A peanut would be big enough because it's all they think about themselves. How big are you? You're as big as your love, as big as your interest, as big as your thoughts, as big as your, the thing you're living for and dying for. So Roland has a big mind, and he dreamt that somebody knocked the door of his, the front door of his mind, and so he walked over there, and he opened the door, and there, guess who, to Jesus, like that. He opened the door, and he said, oh, Jesus, come on in, and I'm so glad to see you. But to his dismay, Jesus shook his head and said, no, I cannot come in, Roland, unless you allow me to occupy the throne. I've got to be your Lord, your master, your king. Can't come in at all. That's the condition on which he comes in. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom and it isn't a democracy. You don't, God isn't running for election. You come in there and it's an absolute monarchy too. Stalin and Lenin and Hitler never were as absolute as God is. You come in to obey the king and ruler. That sounds pretty stiff until we remember that it's the way Jesus is himself. I'm going to say this very reverently now, but because it might sound as shocking as my cannibal story. Jesus Christ himself has to earn the confidence of the God Almighty which gave him the whole universe by being absolutely, utterly, totally, completely, and forever obedient. If he disobeyed God for an instant, the same thing that happened to him that happened to, to uh, who was that fellow anyhow? Lucifer. And Lucifer, yeah. And, but Jesus says that 59 times, no, 49, you got that figure wrong. Forty-nine times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says this, I never do anything, say anything, think anything, excepting what I hear the Father tell me to say and do and think. Look it up. 
That gives you a whole night's work tonight if you want to look up those two things. How often did Paul say Christ liveth in me? How often did Jesus say he never does anything except in the will of the Father? You'll find the number that I gave you is correct. And so what he asks of us is only what God asks of him, the Father asks of him. Absolute obedience. Now that would drive us, you and me, into dismay if uh, it weren't for one thing. And that one thing is that when we're reborn, even our wills are. You and I know this, at least if you're like me, and you are, you're no better than I am, without Christ. You know you couldn't obey that well. You're like Paul, he said, wretched man that I am. I, I didn't intend to do the things I did, and I do the things, and, and the things I intended to do, I don't do. Who will ever do to deliver me from a body like this? But the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes in and makes us a new creature, gives a rebirth to our wills, too, so that we will want to do right. The alcoholic anonymous knows that. He knows that if he says to God, God, I'll follow you from now on, that he's lying, because he won't. He'd get thirsty, he'd get a headache, he'd get a hangover, and he'd go and get another drink, and he knows he will. But he doesn't have to promise that. All he has to say is, here, just as I am without one, please take me, give me a new birth, including a new will. And it, that, it works. There are people in our CFO camp who know by glad experience that once they were alcoholics and now they're born again. The desire for it's gone because they have his will, his reborn will. But this thing isn't hopeless. Well, uh, I want to take a lot of corollaries, and I must explain what a corollary is to some of you. How many ever studied geometry when you went to high school? Raise your hands, your college. Well, and I guess I don't need to explain it only to a few of you, but I'll remind you, some of you look as though you've been quite a while but since you studied it, uh, that uh, in geometry they have what they call a proposition. And we'll take one of them and illustrate what a proposition is. It's a, geometry is a study of lines. The three lines like that make what they call a triangle. And on the inside corners, there are the three corners, and they call them angles. And the first proposition they prove, at least one of the first in geometry, is that if you had that made of wire, and you stretched out those angles, or you had three angles, and you put them together like this, they always form a straight line. No matter whether they're two lines that run up to the moon and one across here, or whether they're equilateral or right angle triangles, no matter what it is, it doesn't seem reasonable. I can never believe it, but yet you can prove it. Now, that's all the geometry I'm going to give you, but beyond this, Underneath every proposition, there are several what they call corollaries. Now, if that be true that those three inside angles are a straight line, then this is true, this is true, this is true, and I won't tell you what those are right now, I forget anyhow. But I'm going to tell you what the corollaries of Christ living in me are, at least some of them. And here's where I'd like you to help me this week. Think it over, and if you get any bright ideas, They'll be in the next book if they are really bright. I want to talk, how many corollaries are there of this amazing thing that Christ comes in if you give him your will and let his, him rule, he'll come in and live with you. Well, the first corollary would be this. This is his house and mine. And so we dwell together, my Lord and I, in the same house. Uh, the nuns in the Catholic Church all try, if they're real devout, to get married to Jesus. And there's something in the Bible about that that makes it sound reasonable, especially the song of songs. But I'm a man, and I never could vision myself getting married to another man. 
but I can be a junior partner. He can come in and run the business. I sell off to him, and hereafter I'm his employee. My shingle before Christ came into this body was Frank Lola, out to enjoy life, have friends, make some money, and get a position somewhere, or an automobile, and be comfortable. But when he came in and I sold out to him, gave myself to him, the shingle, the outside notice, if there was any, changes. What is it now? Guess. You all know? Becomes the kingdom of God. That's our business from now on. To help make this old world here of ours and fulfill the Lord's prayer that thy kingdom may come and thy will may be done on this earth. That's our business, Lord, yours and mine. The business he started 2,000 years ago. The business he continues as senior partner in this house. We dwell in the same house. Well, let's get it. Live it. I shut my eyes right now. You can't see out there, maybe, but I do. I know they're shut. I have pulled down the window curtain, and there's nobody back there but him and me. We live in this house. Now, well, the second corollary is this. <coughs> If we're engaged in partnership, it's not my business, but his that we're running now. And his business is uh, continuing what he started in another body named Jesus of Nazareth. They walked down through Palestine. He was in that body making the kingdom of God. Now he's in this one. And if he's in you, he's in that one. The next corollary is this. If God, if the Trinity, if Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Father are in me, working with me, my goodness, there's no limit to what we can do if he may want to, if he wants to. My sure isn't if I want to. I'm the junior partner. I do his will, not mine. I don't boss him around. I don't snap my finger and say, get busy, Lord, to him. Now, where is he in me? Maybe you can help me think that through. I'm thinking it out yet. He's in my mind if I have him in mind. Rather a silly thing to say, but true. Two ways of saying the same thing. He's in my heart if I love him. Because the heart is our symbol for love. He's in my hand if... Uh, his will rules my will, and my will makes that hand move. I'm like the clutch in the automobile, but the hand that holds the clutch really decides where that car shall go. Not the clutch. But I'm more in the clutch. His will decides. Kagawa saw that. He was wonderful, Kagawa. He's the greatest Christian Japan has produced. And Japan is all literate. It's more literate than the United States. We're only about 94% literate in the United States, but Japan is 99% literate. Everybody can read and write in Japan. And Kagawa wrote books about Jesus. He wrote 100 books, and they were read all over Japan. It was a great reading nation. And Japan is the only country, the country, which faster than any other in the world is turning from paganism to Christianity because Kagawa wrote a hundred books about Jesus and they were read. And now when Stanley Jones or Billy Graham or Oral Roberts or somebody wants to have a great big in gathering of souls, they go to Japan and gather the harvest that Kagawa planted, writing his books. Now you'll begin to see meaning in this poem. It's a profound poem. Who's writing? Kagawa is now. Today, a wonderful thought in the dawn was given. And the thought was this, that a secret plan is hid in my hand. And my hand is big, big because of that plan. 
that God who dwells in my hand knows the secret plan of the things he will do for the world using my hand. See what profound meaning that had? Writing books. God wrote books using that hand. So it's in your feet if he directs your feet up to help build the kingdom of God. He's in your mouth, you preachers, if you're using, he's using your mouth to help build the kingdom of God. He's in your eyes, he's in your, in your face, if you're smiling like Marge does for the kingdom of God. He's over, he's in our running through our, coursing through our veins and through our nerves, he's all through us. If so be he lives in us. Well, and the way he lives in us, I wish you'd help me think this out a little bit better, as far as I've been able to see so far, is by being back of our will. It's his will, telling my will what to do. I listen. All I have to do the rest of my life is to hold my ear close to his lips. Of course, my inner ear, close to his inner lips, where he is, and say, what next, Lord? Listen and say, yes. No will of my own. This song, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. What perfect statement of what I've been trying to get at, that is. And we go on hastily, while this clock will stop. If this be true, what I've just said, then Every minute of the day, if we're like Jesus, we're we'll doing this thing to that inner voice. I've written a song. I wish that uh, those of you who go to the writing class would improve it. I'll try to get it written off. It, I don't know what's the matter with it. It's a wonderful word, but it doesn't sound good when these CFOs try to sing it, so I won't try to give it to you as it is. It runs like this, all the time, all the time, all the time. We can listen to the Lord all the time. We can always hear him if we stay right near him all the time, all the time, all the time. And two or three verses like that. The thought is, for me, the profoundest, deepest Christian truth. So we have to do all the time, all the time, all the time. And then those of us who try this, have coming sweeping through our souls sometimes as I did this afternoon out prayer group until I wanted to fall in front of those people. That great inner joy that never comes from anything human, no human experience, is like that ecstasy that comes in. at times, not all the time. Now the next one is this, next corollary. He dwells in everybody who welcomes him, and everybody who has him inside is the church. The church is not the building. That's a great mistake to think you built a church, you never did. You just built a sanctuary for your churches. Your churches are your people. They come together and the total number of them are his total body. You are the body of Christ, each of you and severally and all of it put together. That's the deep truth for in Christ. And so here, I love this this afternoon when, uh, when our leader was saying, wasn't that a wonderful meeting this afternoon of testimony? Our leader was saying, look in each other's eyes for Christ. That's right. If you are his child, the child of God, it's because Christ in you is the divine you and look for Christ there. That's right. Look for him in me. And I look for him in you. And when we do that, as we often do in CFO camps, oh, how we love each other. 
because we love him in one another. <coughs> then uh, we can expect uh, all kinds of miracles to happen if he lives in us. But mind you, I didn't say that we can tell him when to have those miracles. I've just been with a man uh, named Holmes up at Chautauqua, and uh, I never was quite so intimate with anybody who is wonderful here. I've known Genevieve Parkhurst a long time, but still never felt intimate with her as I did with this man. And I said to him, Holmes, I believe in you. If you would uh, cure that woman whose head is about down to here, she can't walk like that. That, that would be outstanding. You'd have everybody believe in you. Yes, he said, but I can only do that when God wants it done. And as yet, I'm not convinced that that would be better for her than to be the way she is. As soon as she tells me, it'll happen. Now, that's something about healing. You say to these healers, you can't do it all the time. No, never, unless God tells you to do it. Don't you think that's a valid corollary of this? Now, one more thing that'll shock you. And I'm done with the shock. Maybe. Maybe. And, uh, it's this. If Christ is in you, as he was in Jesus of Nazareth, you might get crucified again. Your body might get crucified. Is somebody going to write a wonderful book before long? Maybe it'll be one of you. Maybe your uh, writing class will start it. It needs to be done. Not since Fox's Book of Martyrs is written centuries ago. Has there been a book written about the martyrs in the early church? About men like Paul who said he was glad to repeat the sufferings of, to complete the sufferings of Christ in his own body. About the thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of martyrs who went singing while they were burned at the stake and crucified and thrown to the lions and to the wolves, thanking God that they could be crucified with Christ. They were Christ being crucified again. There's a poem. The first time I heard it, I remembered it, and I never forgot it. There's only a three or four like that, a couple of limericks. I get, well, I think we will get to fill it for a minute. Here's a limerick that I never forgot. The Honorable Henry Ward Beecher called the hen a beautiful creature. The hen, pleased with that, laid an egg in his hat, and so, thus did the Henry Ward Beecher. Now that is, I didn't never forget that limerick. I once heard it, I never forget this poem. But I didn't know what it meant until lately. Whenever there is silence around me, I hear a cry. The first time I heard it, oh, it comes down from a cross. The first time I heard it, I went out and searched, and I found a man in the throes of crucifixion. And I tried to take the nails out of his feet. But he said, let them be. I cannot come down until every man and woman and child in the world comes to take me down. Now, that's obviously untrue. Because the Bible says that that very evening, Joseph of Arimathea got permission from Pilate and took him down and put him in a tomb if it meant just one body. But if you are the body of Christ and you are crucified, then he cannot come down from you at cross until every man, woman, and child comes to take him down. Someday we're going to see a profound truth that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. And so if you suffer, and you learn like Paul did, I think tomorrow morning, maybe I will talk about Paul. Uh, no matter what happened to him, it was just Christ completing the conquest of the world through suffering. I don't mean you'll all suffer. Oh, we will all will sooner or later. But there isn't any heroism in 
running away, running away, keeping no, uh, keeping alive as long as you can, and at last dying of cancer or something. No heroism in that. But then you go out and suffer. But I'll give you a story. I told you about the cannibals. A year ago, I was in West New Guinea, and there was Betty Larson, and she brought a half dozen cannibals from about 50 miles, where she had converted them into Christians, and we made lessons. It was the first time they'd ever had anything written in their language. And Betty told me her story. She said, three years ago, my husband and I went up there to that tribe where nobody had ever gone before, and they promptly drove a spear through my husband's heart. And when they took me home, to their homes, but they didn't hurt me, and I learned their language, and I converted the whole lot of Christianity. And they're all Christians now, the whole tribe, for three years. And I said, but Betty, why didn't they drive a spirit through your heart? She said, I asked him, and they said, oh, you're only a woman, you won't hurt anybody. That kind of heroism is going on around the world. They went out to find it, like these people down here in Ecuador. You can run away from a cross. Jesus could have. All he had to do was stand still, not go on to Jerusalem. He never would have been crucified. Now, the last thing I want to say, though, is this. Don't worry about that. I was worrying about something last night, and I opened my Bible, and there, right into my face, came the New English Version. You must not worry. God knows what you need. And so don't worry about whether you might be crucified. If you were, it wouldn't matter. You probably wouldn't feel it. Maybe you wouldn't, and maybe you would. I don't know. But the reason why you don't need to worry anymore, if Christ is in you, if, you, if he isn't, you have a reason to worry. But if he is, first of all, he made the world. He made you. He made everything. He can do anything he wants to. He can change anything anytime he wants to, and he does whatever he wants to. That's number one. Number two, he knows everything. He's been around a long time. If this world is, this uh, planet has been going for 10 billion years here, he was here before it started. He knows everything, everything. He knows the tiniest little thing about you. And the third thing that makes you throw away your troubles, don't be anxious, because he loves you more than you love yourself. You don't love yourself very well. If you did, you wouldn't have been such a fool so often. And, and I wouldn't have been. Uh, you and I have been fools many a time. We've done the thing that hurt us. Uh, and it was, but he never will do a thing that hurt us. He loves us. He can do everything. He knows everything. So stop worrying about yourself. He said, don't be anxious about yourself, but seek the kingdom of God. Seek our job, our shingles out there, and all these other things he'll take care of them. Or they added to you. Now I'm done with one more thought tonight. Oh, I've got several, but we got to stop anyhow. But here's one. He, uh, if he's inside, we can talk to each other in there. I like to be in a room alone. Maybe one night I may tell, although I, everybody's heard it, I guess they heard me. The story of my, the first time I, God ever talked to me on Sigmund Hill. But ever since that, 32 years ago, I don't pray excepting in public to be heard. In private, I never make a monologue to God and explain things to Him. Just, God, what should we talk about? And then my lips begin to talk to me. But if they don't, I can, if you're around and I, we don't want your lips to be heard. We can talk to each other down inside. If he's there, we talk together. And so we walk together, my Lord and I. And I'm going to end with this lovely thing from, uh, uh, from Reverend A.B. Stimson. I was telling you about that missionary, Betty Larson. She belonged to Christian Missionary Alliance. And the man who found it is one of the great, most saintly men out of the world has ever known. He deserves to be famous. His name is Reverend A.B. Simpson. 
And this is what he says about it, his relationship with Jesus. When he's talking, he said to me, this is Simpson talking now, oh, so tenderly, my child, just take me and let me be in you myself. I placed my eyes on the Christ in me, and I found him larger than the moment's need. I found him the Christ that, I, that had all I shall ever need. When I thus saw him, it was all right and right forever. He said to me, my child, you must come to me for the next breath. Because I love you so dearly, I want you to come all the time. If I gave you a great supply, you'd do without me. And you wouldn't come to me so often. Maybe that's the reason why he doesn't answer prayer right away. The talking with him is more important than the answer he might give. Now you have to come to me every second and lie on my breast every moment. I had to learn to take from him my spiritual life every second to breathe him in and breathe myself out. You say, isn't that a terrible bondage to be always on the strain? What, on the strain with the one you love, with your dearest friend? No. It comes as naturally as a fountain, without any effort. For true life with him is always easy and overflowing. Now I have it. Not only what I have room for, but that which I do not yet have room for, but I shall be full whatever I have room. In the eternity that lies ahead of me, I'm like a little bottle in the sea, as full as it can hold. As a bottle's in the sea, so I am in Christ, and Christ is all in me, and a whole ocean full around me. God seems to speak to me so sweetly. Never mind, my child, if you have nothing, for I have the power and the love and the faith and the blessing you need. I am all you need within and all you will need without forever. That's the way it is. Christ lives in you. And let's pray. to us, Lord, besides this, I know you want us all to welcome you and all to yield to you and all to say we do the best we can and hope that you will make us strong and feel better. But you're not happy just to have us. You won't be happy till everybody Here's your knock at the door, like that Solomon's Christ there. And everybody opens the door and says, Come in as my Lord and my King and my Master and my Lover and my friend and my senior partner. So we pray for this world that we're sitting on top of tonight. Thank you for listening to this message from the CFO Classics Library. If you would like to listen to more messages from the library, please visit our website at cfoclassicslibrary.org. 
Or if you would like more information about the camps farthest out or would like to find a camp near you, please visit their website at cfonorthamerica.org.